So just earlier, I saw you were uh, working on some ICO stuff. I thought it was uh, really cool. So. Yeah, still working on that uh, ICO contract uh, for my next tutorial. Um, yeah, that's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's like a cash script has a different uh, paradigm, I guess, you know, as you, you surely well know. Um, yeah, it's, but uh, I have, I think I have it mostly done. I have, um Three, I think three functions and the one to purchase is, is I think is in good shape and as well as the one to end and now I just took, oh no I have four functions now I just have to write the, the one to claim refunds and the one to unlock the ICO, uh, the BCH Yeah I've been thinking about uh, smart contracts too a bit lately because then we're with, uh, with the cash ninjas we're at thinking about what the best way to do the minting smart contract is to open source uh, to open source it and there's like two big ways to do it so either you could when each nft is minted you could do the payout which i think is pretty cool but then you have a lot of utxos right so imagine you do a mint from 10,000 nfts so 10,000 people interact with the contract and then you would have 10,000 like payout utxos so the, ov the other uh, way to do it is to just store all the bch in the contract and then to have some kind of withdraw function. But then you need to think a bit about who can like initiate this function. So is this one person or multiple person in the team? And does the withdraw function, does it uh, yeah, like pay out one address or does it trustlessly pay out, uh, split the funds over multiple uh, addresses? But uh, yeah, the, the advantages of this is of course that there's less UTXOs on the blockchain, but then the contract size is a bit larger. So, uh, also for the just the regular mint use case, the contract would be larger. So yeah, that's uh, also some stuff that I've been thinking about. And then of course there is the flip starter now, which is still running for uh, cash cubes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. That that your flip starter is almost done, right? Yeah, it's almost almost funded. So uh, probably in the next couple days somewhere, or maybe if people uh, want to wait out until the time they get really close, it's of course. Uh, I think we saw, we've seen that before. Uh, these flip starters get funded at uh, last minute because yeah, people think someone else will contribute and uh, finish off the uh, fundraiser. So yeah, it can go either way. Mm, yeah. What I thought. I I did. Oh sorry. You, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to say what I thought was uh, cool to see was projects like uh, Fix dot Cash uh, contributing. So because they use our tooling and then. It is a nice way to give back and uh, like the ecosystem coming together. So yeah, I thought it was uh, pretty cool. And general protocols, of course, with BCH Bull. So a uh, shout out to them for uh, contributing too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, actually I saw that uh, Renegade wanted to uh, contribute to your flip starter, but I think the error he ran into was that he wanted to pledge more than it would take to complete the oh. order, which is a little bit of a weakness of flip mm -hmm. right yeah, yeah. Mm. oh that's funny and I, I, I should take a chat to him yeah, yeah he, he posted in one of the channels i don't remember which one but i also see you've been working on a um you've got a, a repo called p to sh uh assurance contract and that would include like stretch goals right so it kind of fixed that problem yeah yeah so it's a bit of a, an older repo now uh so it was like the first thing i really developed with cash tokens when it was still on chipnet so it was a kind of demo so we looked at how we could improve improve this uh this assurance contract like this uh, flip starter setup so instead of just a like where anybody can add inputs and the output is fixed it would be a smart contract uh, yeah, uh, like your ICO setup where the smart contract issues receipts. So these are NFTs, but they, I meant, so if the fundraiser doesn't complete that you can give your uh, receipt back to the contract. And then this will prove that you had contributed a certain amount and then you can uh, get a refund if the, if the amount isn't successfully raised. So yeah, yeah. this was, uh, yeah, as I said, an older repo, but the first demo that I had worked 
working on a uh, chip net. So pretty proud of. Mm. But it would be cool. Mm. I think Sahit is doing some work to make it into a real application because demos are cool and all. And they are proof of concept, but uh, it's very cool to have actual users. Because of the same thing with Flipstarter, right? It's also possible to do that, the Flipstarter tech on uh, BTC or on BSV or eCash or whatever, or, or even Litecoin. Uh, but yeah, they mm -hmm. didn't work this out. So, and I think for the BCH ecosystem, Flipstarter has been a very important tool. It has been, they are both used for some less important uh, projects uh, and some that probably didn't deliver as much, but also for a very important like I think the work we're doing on Cash Crypt is pretty important and it wouldn't be that easy otherwise to get get funding for uh, Roscoe and I to keep working on it. So uh, for us, it has worked very well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think uh, there's been like more than 13,000 uh, BCH raised via Flipstarter. And it's, you know, it's considerably decentralized. Um, you know, anyone can create one. And um, yeah, I mean the the protocol, um, the the pro what are the the full nodes have done have raised tons of money. They're completely funded by them. Yeah, right. This was um, the initial reason uh, to get funding for the full node development teams with the uh, eCash controversy. And now recently, BCHD has done another successful fundraising uh, with Flipstarter to get uh, back up to speed with the cash tokens upgrade. So I was really glad. Uh, glad to see that because yeah, BCHD is still important infrastructure, and it was unfortunate that it uh, like was no longer in consensus and was no longer maintained. So it was good for someone to step up and then for the community to uh, fund this effort. So. Definitely, yeah. Kudos to Opportun for that. So yeah, so we have uh, some listeners. Just want to welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, we're talking about you know building with uh, BCH cash tokens, and really whatever else you want to talk about. Uh, if you want to speak, uh, feel free to you know request. And um, yeah, so let's see. Um, I was gonna. I had something I was gonna say. I forgot. <laughs> Take your time. I'm sure it's all come back to you. <laughs> um, oh yeah, I was also going to say the uh, the B coin uh, full node that's written in JavaScript. Uh, it'd be cool to see that one come back as well. You know, along with BCHD, of course. Oh yeah, that's that's a project yeah. that I haven't heard mentioned in a while. But indeed, uh, the more the merrier, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I talked to Jonathan, the guy who uh, kind of updated it. Uh, I think he updated it through the 2021 uh, network upgrade and he's still interested in working on it. You know, of course, you know, like, I don't know if we really need this many full nodes, but still it's pretty cool. And it could be a good learning opportunity, you know, for uh, anybody who has a script or wants to learn it. Yeah. So my current stance is that we, with the cash tokens, I uh, think that there's a lot of opportunity for cool applications. So while full, it's essential to have a, a few like uh, good full nodes, uh, like full node implementations, but then, and for example, with BCHD, there were already the uh, projects relying on it that got into trouble because it uh, went out of consensus. But also we have the Knuts node implementation, which was also recently or has an ongoing flip starter. I'm, I'm not sure, I haven't checked in a bit. Uh, but I think, yeah, we have plenty of full nodes. So I think if there is, uh, Money raised should go to uh, like more other infrastructure like uh, software tooling and probably to application stuff. So uh, because we can, all the full nodes, like if we have twenty full node implementations, this uh, this will have like very marginal returns. Uh, so yeah, it's better. I think it's now the time for us to focus. Yeah, things like you are doing too, like uh, documentation tutorials are very important. Uh, and then also what I'm trying to do more recently with uh, like uh, the Cash Ninjas uh, project where we want to do open source tooling. Uh, but then, yeah, it's a bit of an entrepreneurial project because uh, we'd also do an NFT project. So it's uh, entirely self-funded. We don't need any external, like it's it's not good to do crowdfunding for everything, right? We want to, do, to be able to, uh, to self-fund or uh, 
yeah, be, be a bit entrepreneurial in how you approach uh, certain things and not, uh, yeah, not to crowdfunding for everything. So I think there's a, a balance and Flipside is certainly has its use, but it's also uh, not like, shouldn't be used for everything, right? So even ICOs, I think ICOs have, have some use case where they are like a valid approach. Hmm. Maybe the, this is controversial now because uh, so many ICOs on Ethereum ended up not delivering, but I think the, the concept of uh, issuing tokens and then paying back dividends or something to, to those tokens or just uh, having like a utility token where the token appreciates in value, like this is a valid, a valid concept. And so it certainly has some, some use cases, uh, but it yeah, has its risks as demonstrated with all the projects that uh, have not delivered. Definitely. I mean, so uh, what was it? The British East India Company. I mean, the the advent of the firm has been a major uh, engine for economic growth, uh, you know, for hundreds of years. And, uh, you know, we need it here, too. Um, and so, yeah, I think it'd be interesting to develop um, contracts that, you know, have like milestones, you know, and that like lock up funds until a certain number of people who bought into the ICO, you know, vote to, to release those funds, that kind of a thing. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, certainly you can do some kind of threshold system. Um, or yeah, even more generally with DAOs, with uh, uh, many of these things are where you have a general pot of money, which is then in part managed by a, smart contract but many of these DAOs then have yeah, governance issues so uh, as you said some of these problems are not new to crypto it's like more general firms have governance issues like corporate governance is a pretty big field and consultants get paid a lot of money to <laughs> think about corporate governance so uh, yeah we certainly yeah. have our part to yeah to also look what what has has been tried before with crypto and not to, uh, to reinvent the wheel but uh, to innovate, you know, but mm -hmm. yeah, talking about corporate governance, like, I don't know if you've seen that uh, TV series on HBO Max called Succession. Um, it's, it's quite good, you know, but it's all like drama around corporate governance. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I, I haven't seen it. So. It's, it's a good series. Yeah, it's a good series. Uh, but I think I think that that could be one way that we could innovate is uh, in accountability, right? Which is also something that has been lacking a little bit in uh, in the Flipstarter world. Because, for example, you know, we were talking about the uh, Bcash uh, JavaScript node earlier, and um, somebody ran like uh, I think it was like during the network upgrade in 2020. And someone ran a flip starter to bring that node back. And it it got completely funded. But it turns out it was completely fake. It was absolutely fake. Somebody just oh. ran off with the funds. Yeah, I hate to, hate to hear that. Yeah, and so it was it, not some known member in the community, or was it a, was it an anonymous? Yeah, uh, I'm I don't interested remember. in the detail. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember. But I remember even some people were like, yeah, this doesn't look right. But still, it got fully funded because, you know, it was a, it was a tense time and everybody was looking like there was a but, little bit of a battle. But, to see yeah, but sometimes it can also be. Uh, so imagine if it was only half funded, then the person like uh, doing the flip start would also have an incentive to complete it himself just to, to make sure he got half of the money. Right. So you, you never know. But it's hard to know for sure what the exact amount is unless there's a... You, you see what I'm trying to say? So uh, yeah, just like people watch trade NFTs to make it look like there is a, a very high value. In principle, it could, it could be that the amount raised isn't actually the amount of money he, he, he got or like he, he stole from people. Um, yeah, so I, I, of course, I'm hoping already that it is the case because it sucks that there is real money needed to build a lot of cool things. And some people trying legitimate things have a hard time, like uh, finding investors or uh, capital. And then some people, uh, yeah, run scams. Of course, it's always the way it goes, but uh, it's still. 
Yes, so accountability is very important, I agree. Yeah. And speaking of that, um, I've some people, you know, even like the, the BCH faithful uh, that I've pitched uh, cash token stuff to, even just trying to give them free NFTs have been like, oh, you know, I'm worried about this, you know, being just a repeat of smart BCH. Um, but it's, this is completely different from smart BCH. Oh, yeah. So it's, uh, if I can do like the, uh, the whole picture story. So um, yeah, the whole of, of bit, yeah, of tokens on Bitcoin. So there were uh, early attempts, like even on the Bitcoin talk forums, tokens, like other assets on the Bitcoin blockchain is a very odd ID. And people had many different uh, specific like uh, ideas of how this should be done, these other assets. But then the first real uh, way it was implemented on Bitcoin that I know of is a uh, Counterparty and Counterparty still runs to this day. So Counterparty is known from its rare Pepe NFT collection. And it's also uh, Spells of Genesis. This is also an uh, early NFT collection. It was, uh, it was um, gaming, NFT gaming concepts. So it tries to be, I think, a bit like Hearthstone in that respect. And then you have Omni, the Omni tokens, which were also on BTC. And I don't know of many projects that were using it, but Tether was the prime an example that used uh, Omni tokens on BTC. So those were, were all like layer two token protocols. So they were very limited in what they could do. And especially with counterparty, there was a big con controversy because the counterparty relied on the op return data, but then the uh, core developers on BTC, they like wanted to shrink the op return data and that would like totally destroy the, the way the counterparty token protocol uh, worked. So they, they had to like move around and they really didn't feel welcomed on BTC because of that. Um, so overall there was, I would say little progress, uh, just like Vitalik at first wanted to build his stuff uh, on top of Bitcoin, uh, on top of BTC, but then got like, uh, he got pushed back, like he got uh, shown the door. Uh, it was a bit the same with these counterparty tokens. Like instead of being encouraged, uh, they really got a lot of resistance from the the core uh, the core no teams or the the main people doing the yeah doing the consensus uh, work. Or even like with up return, it's like more a standardness rule, but it's like still very important what everybody configures because otherwise, yeah, if if nobody uh, will accept your uh, operator and output in his mempool, then it's very hard for you to uh, make these transactions. So you would need help from a miner. And then there was the, the Bitcoin cash split. And one of the first things uh, that was led by Bitcoin Unlimited, uh, one of the first ideas that Bitcoin Unlimited came up with was the op group, so group tokens, which was a proposal for native tokens on Bitcoin cash. So finally, there was like resurgence in discussion around how to do tokens properly. So not just these uh, layers on top where you need a separate indexer and where you need uh, new wallets and you can have accidental burning because on counterparty, it's also possible to accidentally burn your tokens if you don't use a token aware wallet. I think you also need to uh, use separate, yeah, separate addresses and use uh, separate infrastructure, so trusted indexers because it's uh, very hard to scale these uh, layer two token protocols with SPV. Like, uh, and we had the same issue then with SLP tokens, so on Bitcoin Cash, uh, the group tokens were not activated so because there was a lot more research needed. And then we ended up going uh, in this in-between solution where it was a non-consensus token protocol that got popular, the simple ledger protocol. Uh, mm -hmm. So as many people in yeah, BCH know, it got some traction. It, it used to do NFTs too, uh, fungible tokens, and there were special wallets that, uh, that used these SLP tokens. But the same problems from before uh, arose. So there were indexer issues, needed special uh, wallets, and it didn't scale. So you couldn't uh, SPV validate. So you would have to trust an indexer to say if your token transaction or the token that you received, whether it was valid or not. So, but all along this, um, the research on native 
tokens continued. And I would say uh, opcube, yeah, it merged, it, it got changed. It was no longer an opcode. It became a uh, dupe tokenization. So it saw some different revisions, uh, but it was still, uh, I would say very complex. Like I never, never fully understood it. Uh, and it was also reworked a few times to include some stuff and then exclude other stuff. So it had some authority, some melt authority, mint authority. So these were all uh, different concepts that it introduced. And then uh, finally, out of the work of Jason Dresner, he made a proposal called um, PMV3. So this was a proposal um, for a new transaction format. And this would introduce native tokens in a different way through recursion. And this was uh, technically a very interesting proposal. So then he later withdrew it. So uh, I don't think it was ever implemented in a full node. But this, this uh, PMV3 ID together with OpGroup and the work of a Bitcoin Cash artist is then what became Cash Tokens. Um, I think there is some, some minor like uh, token protocol IDs in between, like Mitra, which, which was also called Nimbus at some point. So it also used uh, the idea of recursion. Like if you know that a certain uh, token transaction is valid and you can prove that each step is valid, then you know that the whole chain is valid. So a bit like uh, induction proofs. I think uh, that's what they, like it's from mathematics. Same idea, if you know that the induction base is correct and the induction step, then you can uh, say that the whole chain of uh, logical reasoning is correct. Um, so this is the way we ended up with cash tokens. What the main breakthrough of cash tokens was that none of the uh, token proposals, like native token IDs before it had, was that cash tokens is a general smart contract upgrade. So it happens to do like JPEG NFT collections and it does uh, fungible tokens, but that is not the main, like that is not the heart of what it introduced. Uh, so as you know, the heart of what it introduced is these contract verifiable messages. So a way for contracts to attest to some information um, and to communicate this information to each other. So NFTs are more than just the NFTs we know from Ethereum, like the ERC721 standard. NFTs on Bitcoin Cash are primitives. So they are embedded in the UTXO and they can keep arbitrary data. So for a contract, this means that the NFT can hold contract state. So for example, an NFT can remember how many, how many tokens it issued or it can remember a hash, and this hash can be a, a full Merkle tree, so which if you hash all the leaves that you get to this uh, Merkle root. And there, so this way, this is a general concept for uh, local state. So on Ethereum, everything is global state, which has a lot of advantages in writing smart contracts, but scales very poorly. And cash tokens is the breakthrough that adds like local state in a very clean way to Bitcoin Cash and these local states can then be passed or transferred through these NFTs. So these, these are messages that then can be communicated across from con uh, contract to contract. And this way you can have very complex decentralized applications. So that's the key breakthrough is adding tokens in a way that allows for these complex uh, smart contracts which can interact. Yeah, I am so excited about cash tokens. I was really encouraged to see what came out of that, uh, the community process uh, where uh, Jason and uh, Bitcoin Cash Autist and others, um, you know, you included all cooperated uh, to come up with what I consider really elegant, you know, and it is it is important. Uh, by the way, I just want to welcome Dino Pons as a speaker. Feel free to join in anytime. Anybody else who wants to speak, you're, you're very welcome. Um, I think just think it is important to take note like of how elegant it is, how it's incorporated into the UTXO format. So they're on mainnet, you know, it's part of L1. It's minor validated. So, you know, it's at the same level. It's really uh, at the, the same thing as BCH in a sense. I mean, not in terms of value or whatever, but um, it's all right there in the UTXO. So it's not going to suffer from the issue uh, the smart BCH had where somebody had to custody the, uh, the BCH and somebody had to, and you had to bridge it. 
uh, across to another chain because Smart BCH is another chain. Uh, of course, I'm sure the cat with cash tokens and uh, you know with all the apps and stuff that it's being developed on it, there's going to be some other problem, right? Yeah. So uh, with regards to Smart BCH, so I w didn't get involved in the Smart BCH ecosystem at all. So just like there's many people on Bitcoin BTC that don't get involved in rootstock at all, they just ignore like sidechains uh, or ignore liquid. I didn't really get involved, but I was really interested with the bridging tech. So I made a demo for them, uh, showing how it could, it's similar to the drive chain concept actually. It uses uh, minor voting. So you needed to include a Coinbase output in one of the inputs. And this way you could prove that you were a miner, that you mined a block and that you, um, and this way you could vote on uh, processing withdrawal transactions. So for bridging, it's always easy to go to the sidechain because the sidechain can just have a consensus uh, rule which says that they need to validate the whole main chain or all the main chain events. So checking that uh, money goes to the sidechain is very easy because the sidechain can monitor the main chain, but the reverse is not true because the main chain is ignorant of what happens on the sidechain. So you need some way, like a, for example, a federation to tell what has happened on the, on the side chain. So which withdrawals from the side chain should, should be processed and which are like illegitimate, uh, which withdrawals are fake trying to get back funds that they don't have on the side chain. Um, so the, the, the idea of minor voting is, uh, yeah, it's a popular idea. It's from Paul uh, Sports. Uh, and he's now yeah, back in the discussion on BTC because of this drive chain ID. So that's also what the SBCH team said they wanted to do. And I yeah, tried to help them. I made a working demo on, on the testnet, uh, but they ended up not liking this ID anymore because they uh, got low minor participation. And I think they also were worried about uh, security because we share, of course, the same miners as uh, Bitcoin, so the SHA-256 miner. So BCH already has a small pool. So if you only have low miner participation, then you need to worry about miners, just a big miner, a big pool from BTC, just uh, withdrawing all the funds and es es essentially stealing all the funds on the side chain. So this is also a reason that uh, we, need, we should be very careful about drive chain IDs about on BCH. Some other people have articulated this idea too, but it's like uh, way less secure on a like uh, a minority uh, chain with the mi minority hash, right? So and of, and what ended up happening is they uh, the SBCH team simply did not build any kind of bridge, so it got stuck on the default solution. And I think many people hoped that this default solution was a kind of multi-sig. There are many different trusted entities. Uh, with guard all the money in the sidechain, like in some federated kind of way uh, with a large multi sig or even maybe a three or five. But what ended up, or what actually happened was that the SBCH developers, I think just through sheer incompetence, they gave all the money to a, an exchange they trusted. So this was Coinflex, of course. And Coinflex was not very trustworthy because, uh, because of some drama involving Roger Ver and margins accounts, they ended up being uh, uh, illiquid. So they ended up being involved in lawsuits and they just took control over all the funds uh, in, from the bridge essentially, which was in their custody. But of course, legally it shouldn't have been their money, of course, because it was the, the money BCH from the people who wanted to bridge over to the SBCH sidechain. But uh, this way, uh, I think over half of the BCH in the sidechain got lost because of this uh, because of this this situation where they trusted Coinflex, an untrustworthy exchange, with all the money instead of using a multi sig So it would have been much more reasonable if Coinflex was uh, one of the five signers in a multi sig where they needed a majority, right? But they gave full full custody full trust to an untrustworthy party and they ended up getting wrecked. And I think to this day, there's still lawsuits ongoing, but as I mentioned, I don't have any uh, money, so I don't really follow the lawsuits, 
but as you can imagine, some people uh, got a lot of funds on the side chain, so they uh, are really, yeah. yeah, really involved with however their lawsuit is uh, trying to turn out. Tremendous, yeah, it was a tremendous mess. Um, I could see um, by late 2021 that things were just not right. And in fact, I think uh, a lot of credit should be given to uh, Shomari, uh, who's uh, an ERC, uh, EVM and BCH developer, because he was sounding the alarm on this for months. Um, and indeed, I, I have to agree, like this was just, um, I don't know, it was just so incompetent. And... Um, so disappointing. I don't, I don't. I don't even understand who to blame. <laughs> but um, it's really disappointing. And the good news is that we're not worry about this um, with uh, smart BCH. You know, we'll, sorry, with uh, cash tokens, we'll have to worry about other things, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So definitely, if people want to draw comparisons, uh, like this side chain situation is not. It's not at all comparable because. Uh, and native tokens are on the Bitcoin Cash main chain. They are even by a different team. So none of the same node developers are, are even a lot of the community is different because uh, Smart BCH being a EVM has a lot of interest from people coming from other EVMs. So a lot of projects could, could copy paste or reuse a lot of the EVM infrastructure. Um, so I just want to say it's yeah, different people, different tech, different chain. So it's a, uh, not at all alike, but it was very unfortunate because it did a lot of brand damage, I think, to BCH. In the beginning, it was nice. There was a popular sidechain on BCH, like a root, a root stock uh, exists on, uh, I think it's called SDK on uh, BTC, but then it, that never really got popular. So we got a more popular like EVM sidechain with some traction. But of course, if the sidechain then blows up, and it's a, a disadvantage that it was popular because it, uh, it just hurt more people. So, yeah, unfortunate all around. Yeah, definitely. But um, the cash tokens ecosystem, um, I think, is quite encouraging so far. Um, like Cauldron Swap is a DEX that is uh, kind of in beta now. Uh, there are cool wallets like Cash and Eyes. Zap it, uh, pay Taka, Electron Cash. Um, and there's a bunch of people working on, on Web3 dApps built with cash tokens. Yeah, so I think there's a huge opportunity right now. Um, but of course, it's more difficult to bootstrap this network effect when we have a, a pretty messy history on BCH uh, because of, yeah, there was multiple community splits there was uh, yeah, multiple times that there was unrelated drama with personalities involved. Like, uh, for example, uh, yeah, I, d I don't want to even uh, name names, but there was <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a, lot of, a, lot of <laughs> a lot of drama involved. Uh, and I think now is a great time for builders because it's relatively quiet. So, and there's uh, like technical, technically there's a lot of opportunity. So as you are working on ICO contracts, now I am working on uh, open sourcing like a, uh, NFT tooling for creating collections. Um, yeah, there's actually a cool announcement that I have to uh, that I can say about it. So, oh, nice. uh, Josh Josh Elitoip, who works with us, so from BCHD, uh, who also uh, had a project on SBCH. He uh, upgraded the Hashlips. It's a popular library for uh, making NFT collections, like which uh, randomizes these different layers. So it's mixes the, the art together. So the example, if you have different mouths and different hats, it mixes these layers together to, get, to generate a randomized set. And he upgraded this for uh, BCMR uh, metadata. And if you go to the uh, Cash Ninjas uh, website, you will see several links to the, our GitHub organization. So if you take a look at the GitHub, now there's at least uh, already one uh, open source uh, tooling, which is the upgraded Hashlips library. It's called the uh, I think it's called the Shinobi Ninja Engine or something. Uh, so yeah, this, this will be very helpful for other people trying to do uh, NFT stuff on BCH. Because for example, on Ordinals, I think we can look at other projects to learn about, uh, to learn how we can be successful, right? So for example, Ordinals has very poor technology. 
uh, they have the same issues that other layer two token protocols have. So they rely on indexers. It's very hard to do SPV validation. Um, yeah, for ordinals, it's even more messy because uh, you need to track individual Satoshis. Uh, and then ordinals has also with a fungible token standards. It, uh, it's very poorly optimized. Um, but they, one thing they did do very well was building hype and community and good tooling because it's despite their poor, uh, their poor tech, like the layer two token technology they used, they have yeah, managed to create a big buzz in the crypto space with a lot of, uh, and managed to generate hype. So I think that's one thing missing from cash tokens. So I think the tech is very, very solid. The first few projects we have seen, and as you mentioned, the wallets uh, are quite solid, but then, uh, we need more like exciting projects, more new communities forming. And yeah, one uh, NFTs are certainly a popular way uh, to, to do that, right? To like build a community, have some initial hype, uh, hopefully, yeah, a way to give uh, value back to the holders, things like that. So, yeah, totally. So, uh, for the listeners, the uh, Cash Ninjas pro project is on Twitter at Cash Ninjas BCH. The website is ninjas.cash, and the uh, GitHub is uh, github.com slash cash ninjas. And yeah, I've looked into the Hashlips uh, stuff before, and uh, it's like really the best. So that's so incredible that people are going to be able to use essentially the Hashlips uh, stuff on uh, BCH. That's, I mean, that's amazing. That's huge. A lot of people use uh, hash lips. Yeah, thanks. So, of course, uh, maybe people can think NFTs, that's not the most interesting use case or whatever. But uh, the fact is that, yeah, NFTs are popular and we need good NFT tooling. Uh, and as we mentioned before, you don't want to do flip starters for everything. So we are doing it in an entrepreneurial way. We do one NFT collection and we build all the tooling and infrastructure needed and we will open source everything. So it is... Uh, upgraded Hashlips library is just the first tool, but as more gets finished and tested, and of course we need to write good documentation, we will open source all of it, and then it will be like super easy, uh, hopefully for the next people coming along to deploy an NFT minting contract. Uh, ours will be multi-threaded, so it's uh, like innovative in this uh, in this way, and then it it also has of course the Wallet Connect feature, which has been popular from uh, Ethereum and EVM where you can use a browser extension or another wallet to connect to your dApps. So we want to learn from these other ecosystems and yeah, have a simple open source example where other uh, projects can, like then, then they have this technical hurdle solved and they can focus more on the other uh, aspects of, the, of their project. So I'm really looking forward to open sourcing more stuff in the near future. Yeah, and speaking of communities, I have a community I'm kind of uh, slowly but surely building called a uh, Real Bitcoin Fam, and um, I just want to you know put the message out like the the uh, the goal. My goal here is to be kind of a support network for builders, newbie builders, you know. So you are super welcome to join us. And, you know, if you're going through my, my cash tokens tutorials and you have questions, you know, please ask them in the Real Bitcoin Fam Discord or Telegram or, you know, wherever it works for you. Um, I'm more than happy to hold uh, the hands of newbie developers to get you pointed in the right direction so you can build uh, what you want. And I love, I love, Matthew, that the stuff you're building is uh, open source. And, you know, I just want to, you know, say thanks again. Like you have been so helpful in uh, mentoring me as, you know, I build stuff uh, with Cash Tokens. It's been super, super important. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for the kind words. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, I think it's a bit of a, a, a give and take because I, I'm not, I don't come from a computer science background. So I studied uh, economics, graduated master of economics. And along the side, I, I try to learn as much. Uh, I try to do as much computer science stuff as possible. So self-taught with some great online resources. Um, so now I try to give uh, back. And especially because initially when I wanted to, 
uh, doing more crypto stuff, I needed a lot of help. And I, I think if you ask for help in these Telegram channels, so there's quite a few uh, developer groups, but if you just join a, as many of them uh, for all specific tooling that you use, and you just ask questions, there's a lot of people willing to help uh, because many people, they have been helped before uh, themselves, right? So mm -hmm. I, I have had tremendous help from people, uh, both in... in I, I, uh, the main people that come up for me is the, the team from General Protocols. So a few of them have really helped me in the past. Uh, and Roscoe, who I'm now working with, he has also really helped me when I just got... I got uh, just started with CashCrypt. So it's very cool for me to now be uh, on the same team as him. So I really feel like I, I leveled up my, uh, my skills. But I think it's possible for, for anybody to do this. So I, I was thinking Absolutely. about making, yeah, making a video, like probably two videos. One is you can never become a cryptocurrency developer or something like that. You can never become a smart contract. And the other one is, uh, you, of course, you can become a cryptocurrency developer. Because, and of course, it's not fully true. It's not, you need some like probably logical reasoning skills and a certain, certain interest. But I think if, if people try and they follow a certain path and they are uh, determined, like this is probably the most important, if you are determined and you, you keep at it, I'm, I'm sure uh, other people can also self-teach self them all this stuff. So. Definitely. Yeah. And some of those other groups are Cash Token Devs on Telegram, which is the granddaddy of them all. Or not the mm -hmm. granddaddy. That, that's the daddy group. The granddaddy group is BCH compilers, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> and those yeah, two are awesome. I've gotten a lot of help in both of them. And yeah, I'm like you in the sense like I didn't, I didn't, I don't have a computer science degree. I study, I, my major was history, you know, and mm -hmm. everything that I have learned uh, has been, you know, self-taught or, you know, with mentoring. Um, so, you know, and if somebody wants to get into computer science today, um, I, personally, my recommendation is go find the CS50 course from Harvard on YouTube. Now, it's about 24 hours long, but it will get you up to speed. It will take you from zero and get you to a place where you can start thinking in the comp sci way, you know. So uh, Nurain has had his hand up, and I also want to welcome uh, Thunder, uh, Bitcoin Cash Brazil, Bitcoin Cash TV as speakers. Nurain, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, hello everyone. Welcome. Yeah, uh, it's it's been it's been a while. Uh, you guys have been really busy with the cash token ecosystem. Uh, big shout out to you guys, you and Marty. You guys have been doing a lot. And yeah, your work has been really helpful because I think that's what we need so far. That's the truth. That's what we need in the ecosystem. A lot of people that will cater for, let's say, new builders, like you said, George, and then uh, a lot of uh, tutorials, you know, how to do a lot of things. So, um, and yeah, I think the ecosystem, the cash token system so far has been amazing. Like we have seen, you know, a lot of awesome stuff, you know, from wallets, from new NFTs. And we can't think of, you know, what to come in the maybe new few months or maybe next year. So definitely we might be seeing a lot of awesome stuff. But hey, it's been amazing. I think your tutorials, George, have been really helpful because currently right now, uh, my team, uh, they're working on some NFT and then uh, we've used that. I think I've just left them. Okay, guys, use this tutorial that George created. To go figure it out. So if you guys are done, then I'll comment and see uh, what's the progress. So far, they have been doing a lot of work. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So far, it's been amazing. I think probably maybe next month, uh, they might be ready because, yeah. So I just want them to, okay, like, go and figure it out. So if you guys have uh, tutorials and you have everything, so go and do it yourself. So let me also focus on uh, some other stuff as well. So I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's just great to see. Uh, I think that's what we need so that we can also, you know, uh, encourage more people to join. Definitely, in the, I think uh, these coming weeks, I, I might be doing some work with Google developers. I don't know if you know, guys know about them. So Google developers group, this is this is a group that uh, Google used to sponsor, you understand, local developers. So especially here in West Africa, we have, I think, almost every major city, we have like a Google developer group chapter. So these are local developers, you know, they do meetups, you know, they talk, 
and they just write codes and you know anything about technology. So I happen to be a member. I happen to have like a very good partnership. So we are trying to see how we can make these things stronger so that we can introduce them. You know, okay, guys, this is what we have on Bitcoin Cash. This is what we have on Cash Tokens. Come and explore. Come and build. Come and see what you guys can do. So it's been it's amazing. I think uh, definitely uh, among the resources that I've been gathering. Yeah, includes your work, your tutorials, and also Matthew, you know, videos which yeah, yeah, they are on YouTube. So these are almost all of the resources that uh, I will be sharing with them and, you know, we will also be exploring. So it's been amazing. It's great. So at least we have, we have like a part. Wonderful. Yeah, we have like a part. You know, if somebody saying, okay, I want to build on Bitcoin Cash, definitely before it's, it's very difficult. There is no one place that you can say, okay, check this out or join this or, you know, get started to here. So... You see, a lot of example in Africa now. There's been a lot of efforts, you know, with Ethereum and Bitcoin. They are doing this. Is what currently they are doing? They are trying to see how they can support developers to start building, you know, on Ethereum. But definitely, if you want to also encourage more builders, we have to do the same. So I think it's it's great. Yeah. Wonderful. Is you, has yeah, your so team joined? Uh, Cash token underscore devs on Telegram. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think we have two, two. Perfect. Members. Yeah, two of them that are working on them. I think most of the dev developers, uh, BCH group is the idea. So, yeah. so we have, we have. Yeah, very cool mm -hmm. to hear. That, very cool to hear that you are uh, joining like uh, different developer groups mm -hmm. in, in the, on the African continent. Um, I hope I hope you can get some uh, interesting BCH. So uh, keep us posted on how how your effort is going. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, uh, see, keep up. I think in the last few months I attended like uh, the African Open Source Africa, so which I happen to be like uh, a team member as well. So I was there at the event, and then you know Bitcoin Cash Open Source story. A lot of people got interested, you know, and then we are able to share what we have from developers of Cash, all the resources. I think. It's been great. So I think by doing this, we are like taking Bitcoin Cash to like uh, the bigger developer ecosystem so that they get to know, okay, Bitcoin Cash is also open source and this is how you can build on it. And this is how you, can, you guys are welcome. You guys are free to build anything you like, you understand. And then we have a very good community. If you need help, you can reach out to these people. So I think that's the, that's the goal for now. So... Um... Matthew, what do you think? You earlier you said, uh, you know, it'd be cool to have some exciting uh, DApps, you know, maybe build some hype or whatever. Do you? What would you like to see, or what do you think would be exciting? Yeah, so one thing I'm really excited about is the uh, is Calderon, the Calderon Dex. It is now uh, is the beta version that supports um, creating your own liquidity pools. So I think this is very cool because with the other like uh, the Layer two token technologies like ordinals, you can never create Uniswap style DEXs because you the the script like Bitcoin script cannot the smart contract cannot validate the token, so you can never sell a token to a smart contract and get a BCH or a BTC back. This is not possible. So I think this is a huge advantage of having native tokens. So I hope to see some cool like uh, fungible tokens fungible token projects that actually make use of these uh, AMMs and to see some uh, yeah, larger liquidity pools uh, actually being used. So of course, currently it's still in, in beta. And uh, also the, um, the tooling for fungible tokens has been somewhat uh, less than for NFTs because for fungible tokens, uh, the way uh, cash tokens work is, is you create all the fungible tokens in the Genesis transaction. So there's not like a, with NFT, you have a minting NFT where you can mint or create more uh, NFTs from the same category. But with fungible tokens, uh, all of them are created uh, at Genesis. So if you want to have a reserved supply, so if you want to mark some portion of the uh, fungible token supply as reserved, so not in circulation, you need to do some, yeah, you, have, you need some special tooling to reserve the UTXO, you need to mark it in some way. And this has not been fully worked out and implemented in wallets. Um, so I think this is a, a, a like still a, a, a part for us developers to work on and improve. Uh, there is, I know the Paytaka team is working on tackling this, but uh, as long as it's not easy for people to use this standard and to mark their uh, 
players reserved and it's uh, still a bit of an issue for popular fungible tokens. For example, imagine if Tether wanted to join cash tokens, of course they would probably uh, initially issue a small amount of Tethers, but then uh, as time goes on, the stable, the trusted stable coins, uh, they often grow a lot and they want to issue uh, more of their tokens. So you need a way to issue a large supply in advance or even like a practically unlimited amount and then mark a certain section, a certain proportion of this fungible token supply as reserved. Uh, so you know what the actual amount of Tether in circulation is and what proportion is just uh, created but reserved at their own uh, address, which will uh, only be released into circulation in the future. So I think this is important. And then explorers and uh, wallets need to show which portion is still a reserved supply or if, if it's per unlimited and it should just say which is the supply in circulation so i know your site uh, george token Stork, also has a category for or like a column for uh, circulating supply but uh, mm -hmm. yeah we still need to yeah. break this out for different fungible tokens so it can actually display some useful data right yeah yeah and i i think uh this what you were discussing is super important because for example I would not only just what you said, like the ability to distinguish between how many co how many tokens are actually circulating and how many are, you know, uh, kind of like nominally not emitted or being reserved, but also like I would like to be able to build dApps where, um, you know, I'm not going to just like airdrop a bajillion, you know, to whoever shows up and I'm not going to sell them, you know, for an ICO, even though ICOs I think are cool as we discussed earlier but i want to build a dap and then based on user activity on the dap i want to emit uh tokens to them and this this what you're discussing is super critical for that because as you said uh you know it's with uh fungible tokens cash tokens on bch you have to admit you have to create the full supply of your token you know and so I think it'd be really cool if I could uh, create a token and then create like the max number, what, right? Which is like nine quadrillion or something and then lock it up. And then based on smart contracts and my DAP and code and all that, you know, reward people for, you know, real activity, you know, and then only those people have tokens, you know, or, you know, whoever they've sold, may, they may have sold them to. And then we can build governance, you know, so I can spin the DAP off to, to a DAO and be controlled, but only by the people who have done things to help, um, you know, grow that DAP. D does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me it does. Cool, cool. By the way, I want to welcome new speakers, Bitcoin Out Loud, uh, Neslin, Anybody else who wants to jump in and speak, you're more than welcome. And, you know, jump in anytime. Yes, sir. Sure, John. Uh... Yeah, howdy. I don't think I have anything to add at this moment, but thanks for having me on. Uh, it's our pleasure. Thanks for joining. Yeah, so, so... Another, oh, sorry, another thing I wanted to mention uh, for exciting project i think many people in bch are uh, looking forward to having an over collateralized stable coin so as we mentioned exactly. stable coins are very popular and we need we still even need some improved tooling to have uh, trusted stable coins but of course we we want to do better than just trusted stable coins so over collateralized stable coins like dai like MakerDAO, are seem like the way to go and so people have also talked about uh, tokenizing any hedge contracts so any hedge are like a peer-to-peer yeah, -peer, uh, contracts with just two parties involved, someone who hedges their uh, amount, for example, in dollars, another part, uh, person who goes long, so it takes on additional risk. Uh, but the reason that I think it's not ideal to tokenize these types of uh, contracts is because uh, like DAO, there is one big uh, pool of money, like uh, a big pot of money that is governed by the DAO, but in these any hedge contracts, they are like atomized. So it's better for privacy and this limits, of course, the security risk. But it's uh, not ideal if you want to use an, have an over collateralized stable coin because all of these contracts have different uh, maturities. So they actually expire at a certain point. 
they also have to pay premiums, some of them. So if you want to pay, if you want to hedge and lock up your uh, dollar amount, this can sometimes cost money. Other times it can earn you money. But these premiums and this uh, duration makes it so that it's not good, uh, in my opinion, for a fungible token. So if you want a fungible uh, over collateralized stable coin, then I think it's better to yeah, create something like a MakerDAO, where you have a one big central uh, pool of collateral, which is managed by a DAO, which can, for example, set interest rates and things like that. Um, much more than uh, trying to talk. Of course, you could. And I think it's also cool if people want to tokenize these any hedge contracts. But these are more like tradable derivative contracts then. So uh, if you want to exit your position early, then it's very handy if you can sell your, for example, your long contract um, and someone else can buy this. So it has real utility. But I think uh, tokenized derivatives, while it's a very big market, it's not the same market as stable coins or over collateralized stable coins. Yeah, actually, I was just about to bring up that whole topic of uh, over collateralized or any kind of stable coin, because I think a, a stable coin that, you know, we can trust, quote unquote, <laughs> is kind of a basic building block for DeFi today. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, I have a whole bunch of projects that I want to do, um, but I'm excited to, to see uh, if uh, that can come to fruition. So, uh, for example, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt Go you. Ahead. I was just thinking uh, on SLP, we actually had Tether involved, but to a very limited amount. And I don't know who actually convinced them. Maybe it was Roger Fair or someone from Coinflex or maybe someone, some other party to actually issue on SLP, but their, their use was very limited. So I don't think having a, a trusted stable coin at all will, will be a silver bullet. And um, also, I hope that it would not just be Tether because as everybody knows in BCH, Tether is very shady. So I would prefer USDC or some more uh, trusted company who is uh, probably more regulated than somewhere in the Bahamas who paid for a shady audit like Tether does. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, stable coins would be nice, especially because then real money starts flowing into the ecosystem, right? And people can cash out to their USDCs if they make money uh, uh, like trading NFTs or trading fungible tokens. And it's much more real, uh, like locked in their value than, uh, than having to swap to other tokens or to even to BCH, which is still uh, a lot more volatile than these uh, stable coins. Yeah. So we have a question from uh, B Free. Uh, he tweeted it. Uh, what's the most interesting build so far in cash tokens, and what should we expect in the future? Um, and he also asks how how can one get involved? And probably the best way to get involved is to join uh, the Cash Token underscore Devs group on Telegram. So I yeah, think so you you probably think the, the most interesting build so far is uh, Cauldron Swap, right? Yeah, so I would mention a few projects, but Cauldron is okay. definitely up, up there. Yeah, yeah, Cauldron is... Because it was never done before on Bitcoin. Uh, hmm. Like in the whole Bitcoin family, uh, the, yeah, there's only very few UTXO chains that have a uh, working AMM uh, contract. I think, uh, I think Cardano has one, a very limited one. Uh, mm -hmm. But f f besides that, I can't think of any other uh, UTXO chains that have a working AMM contract. Mm. I, I, I'm also kind of uh, interested in Emerald DAO and uh, the Popcorn DAP, both from uh, Bitcoin Cash Autist, which are innovative, I think. You know, they're kind of proof, mm -hmm. proofs of concept. Yeah, they are very interesting. Uh, I, I minted, like, uh, I minted on the Emerald DAO. Uh, NFT myself, so it's interesting because you like uh, lock up your some amount of BCH, so it's actually a backed NFT to some extent. Uh, it's a vault, and then you earn a small interest uh, by locking up these funds. So I, yeah, I thought it was a very interesting content. And I haven't actually followed what he has been doing recently with the popcorn. It sounded fun, but uh, I I haven't tried it yet. Hmm. So maybe yeah. Yeah, if you can explain, did you did you like try the popcorn uh, app? Or... I think it's basically buying. Um, you know, I looked into it briefly, but it's basically buying. I think uh, a a a unit. Maybe it's an NFT that contains 
X amount of. Um, I can give just a tiny overview if you want. Oh yeah, please do. Thank you. Yeah. So th the way he set it up is kind of interesting. It, you can. It's a contract that can only be interacted with once per block. So every time a block comes in, the entire world is sort of racing to get the popcorn. And the way he set it up is so that you basically pay. I think it's two thousand sats to the miners because, of course, it's just a contract, right? He set up the contract. But once it's set up, it's, you know, not the money isn't going to him. And so it's basically you commit 2000 sats to the miners and you get actually a, a, a UTXO that's a hybrid. You get um, both an NFT, which is supposed to be like the, the, the bag or box for your popcorn. And then you get 50 popcorn fungible tokens with it. Uh, and as far as like actual usefulness, I, I think it's mostly just just sort of like Emerald Dow, just purely proof of concept. But it is kind of fun, and, and it's also sort of showing weaknesses currently in ecosystems. So currently, Paytaka does not support this hybrid UTXO system. And, and even from, you know, regardless of the technical perspective, from a UX perspective, it's not totally obvious how they would want to handle that. Um, because mm -hmm. it, it, it's technically possible to, you know, I guess, send one versus the other, but um, letting the user decide what whether they want to be doing that or why they might want to be doing that is its own kind of interesting problem. Uh, yeah, it's right. I can see that. As a wall of them, I can imagine. <laughs> I'm not even sure how it would display in Cash and Ice. I think the void would display, but then if you want to send, then uh, you might get some some uh, errors because yeah, if it's just fungible tokens and NFTs on the same UTXO, I don't think anyone else has uh, tried that before. So yeah, it's at, at the very least interesting uh, for that. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's I, I think it's I forget the um, the URL, but it's you know when it's hosted on Versal or something. So if you just search like the um, Bitcoin Cash Telegram or something, you'll probably find it. Uh, and I, there was uh, one at least one listing on TapSwap for the uh, popcorn, which I assume was both the uh, bag and the fifty popcorn. But I, I don't really <laughs> know for sure since I bought it, but. <laughs> didn't uh because there's was like 0. 0.00002 bch or something i was like well what the heck i gotta be the first person to buy popcorn. <laughs> uh, yeah you can find it actually at popcorn dash dap dot vercel v-e-r-c-e-l dot app oh there you go so what i think is interesting about these uh no apps is that the is that we're now starting to use the wallet connect stuff in the bch ecosystem so you can Connect, for example, your Paytaka wallet to a top swap, and soon, so there's an open PR, there's a beta version for Cashnice, which also supports uh, Wallet Connect version two. Um, so I think this is a, a, a great way, like, uh, to also enter this Web Web three ecosystem. It's all about connecting your wallet and then signing from inside your wallet, so you can easily use, for example, uh, your phone together with your um, together with your uh, laptop, for example, um, because you just need to scan a Wallet Connect UI code and then you can sign on your mobile wallet. So there's no need to like transfer your specific funds and the, the application can be aware of what UTXOs you have. For example, TopSwap is a great, uh, great use case for this. So if you just connect your wallet and you press list, uh, li create list offer or something like that, list uh, token, then you will see just a list of tokens you have in your wallet without having having sent any actual tokens. Just because you connected your wallet, it knows your address and it can scan for uh, the different UTXOs. So that is a great UX, I think, great user experience. You just select the NFT you want, and then it asks you to sign sign the transaction. So there's no need uh, with like a built-in web wallet to first send the NFT and then create a smart contract in the background. Uh, it all happens in one go. Yeah, the Wallet Connect functionality is awesome. I mean, it works very, very similarly to how like MetaMask and you know uh, Ethereum DApps work. And now, not only do we have uh, the Paytaka browser extension, but also Zapit has released one. Yeah, guys, I, I I haven't tried it yet. Is it? Uh, I thought it was announced, but not yet in the uh, Chrome Store. But I might be wrong. I'm looking forward to trying it. Yeah, their, their yeah, wallet is pretty good. But, I mean, it, both wallets are very nice. Yeah, as with any of the cash tokens stack in the beginning, there might be, like, uh, some bugs that need to be ironed out or some specific issues if you make a lot of transactions. 
Um, but yeah, I'm very confident in the teams. To uh, yeah, if if you ever need support, I'm sure they will assist you and fix whatever issue comes up. Hmm. So I don't know how much longer we have you for, Matthew. Uh, but uh, I do welcome anyone to become a speaker and ask any questions that you have for Matthew. He is an outstanding. Uh, Cash Tokens developer, a uh, wonderful resource. He's built a whole bunch of things, uh, such as uh, Cash and Eyes, right? I think that's the most famous one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, contributing to Cash Script, probably. Uh, so be it was Rosco uh, wrote all the stuff for, yeah, it's his project, Cash Script, uh, but he is very involved with Ethereum. So I was the one to push him to uh, pick it back up and upgrade it for Cash Tokens. Uh, and we did the uh, we did the work together then after a flip starter. So I'm also very proud because by enabling like by upgrading cash script for cash tokens, we saw for example the Bitcats minting contract. So this was only possible because we did the uh, the work in advance, right? On on the testnet, you could already use this uh, cash script with cash tokens. And then the fex.cash, like this uh, second AMM that we uh, have seen on uh, cash tokens. Is also using Cash Script, and the Emerald DAO was also using Cash Script. So there's now a, a few projects already using uh, Cash Script with Cash Tokens. So I think this is like the killer use case because before there was not too much you could do with uh, Bitcoin Cash Script, like the scripting language, and then in, by extension uh, Cash Script itself. So there was some like yeah some false technology. Um, yeah, some things with Covenant where you, and with Oracles where you could lock up your money until a certain price point was reached, or you could do derivatives already. But I think now with tokens, we uh, with the cash tokens upgrade specifically, which enables these uh, contract messages between different contract applications. Not only now we uh, are seeing the full potential of everything the Bitcoin script can do with uh, local state and with advanced uh, applications. So yeah, very excited just to see what people will do with these tools. And CashScript is pretty easy to work with. I mean, the it looks a lot like Solidity. Uh, you can run through the CashScript uh, docs at cashscript.org pretty fast. There's the CashScript Playground, which is like an IDE in your browser. Um, and that uh, flip starter to, uh, of, of Roscoe uh, and uh, Matthews, is only needs nine, uh, about nine BCH uh, to finish. Uh, it's at flipstarter.cashscript.org. And with that, they're gonna take it up to a 1.0 release. Um, so that's, that's, that's really positive. Yeah, so I can delve into the changes that we have planned if you want. Uh, oh yes, please, please. Yeah, so there's two main items that we have planned for the, as you said, the version one, 1.0 release. So, uh, the, and the, both are things, uh, like not that we came up with just because we thought there would be like small neat additions. We actually noticed that projects like fix.cash, like uh, which wanted to build AMMs with cash cubes, they had these problems. So we, we want to fix like problems that actually came up for existing uh, projects already. So this way we know for sure that it will, uh, these changes will have a big impact. So the two main changes are first is library support. So in Solidity, it's very common. Uh, also because uh, Solidity has, in, like Ethereum has inheritance. So a contract can inherit functionality from another contract. But this is not true on the UTXO, but still it is very useful to have library import. So if uh, if you write a, a function, which is reused uh, at, at multiple parts of your program or in multiple programs that you have written, then you can easily uh, export it into your own file and make a library and import these functions and give it an easy name. And it might be doing all sorts of complex stuff in the background. So we noticed this for the fix.cache team. Uh, they already created their own kind of uh, primitive library system, uh, which isn't too secure, but which works for them. So we just uh, said to them, wouldn't it be nice if like any other programming language that cache script would support uh, libraries too. And they were very excited about this possibility. So we know for sure that they uh, are looking forward to using this, especially for their uh, math. So they use some complex uh, division, like a uh, modulo mathematics, to, because there is some uh, sm small rounding errors if you deal with very big numbers. 
and with uh, AMMs. So you don't want to have overflows inside your contract. So ov uh, overflowing numbers is not allowed. So you need to carefully think uh, how you want to deal with these uh, very large multiplications in uh, AMMs, especially in these contract uh, what do you call it? constant product market makers. So where it just x times y is c. So this equation can overflow. So they uh, worked out some math which does not overflow, but this is more complex. So it's nice if it can be abstracted away. So this is item one, it's library imports. And the second one is currently, uh, as you probably know, George, is that CacheScript is designed to call functions on one specific smart contract. So the way you do it in the SDK is really like a contract.spend and then you, you call the spend function on the contract. But with these interacting uh, contracts like AMMs, so what fix.cash I want to do is have multiple interacting smart contracts which are uh, all very small in size, but which have to travel together. So it's like a smart contract logic broken up into smaller pieces. Then you need smart contracts to be able to travel together and to interact with each other and to communicate these messages. Uh, but currently, this is not the way the the script, the programming language, like the um, the compiler, allows for this kinds of contracts. But the SDK, so the way you make the JavaScript transactions, it it was not designed for this use case. So we uh, we will extend the SDK to still still uh, keep this simple uh, one contract function calls, but in addition, at a more complex transaction builder where you can have all kinds of smart contract inputs interacting. So uh, awesome. this is something, yeah, so this is something we are excited about, uh, and which is a logical extension for, yeah, for everything cash token. So two items, library imports, and then uh, interacting smart contracts. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited about all this stuff. Um, because there, there are a lot of things that I want to build, you know, like before when I was doing the adoption work, I always looked to, you know, the other people to build the things uh, that I thought, you know, we would need. And now I'm focusing more on, on just building it myself, you know, cooperating with other builders. And uh, I think cash script 1.0 is going to just going to be super important uh, for that. So, yeah, so I, I made a very small uh, pledge to the Flipstarter, and I'm sure it's going to close any moment now. You know, whoever gets those last few in will be uh, the, uh, the hero that gets, uh, gets that one done. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, does anybody want to uh, ask questions, um, you know, offer a comment, uh, bring up a new topic? Um, I know that we talked about about an hour for this, Matthew. So I definitely want to, uh, you know, let you go soon. So because uh, it's basically dinner time, right where you are. Um, so, yeah, I can. Um, I can go for a little while longer if there is uh, interest. But it, as you say, uh, it's if there's questions, now would be a good time to bring up like a, any new topics people might be interested in. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking that uh, I might keep doing these uh, every Friday. Uh, so, you know, uh, anybody who wants to, to keep going, uh, I think that would be awesome. You know, because I see other ecosystems doing regular us. Uh, and, uh, you know, we need to get out there and kind of uh, be, be present uh, in order to keep attracting new builders, um, you know, new holders, et cetera. I there was I did see one interesting thing uh, this morning. I just kind of caught the tail end of a uh, Twitter space by Bitcoin Magazine uh, with uh, the Civ Kit guys, and the title of it was "Bitcoin in the Global South is Unstoppable." <laughs> and uh, you know, for obvious reasons, I mean, I've done like all my adoption work, you know, years of it in the Global South. And I just don't, I just don't get it, you know, how, um, how they think that that's true, you know, of course, this is the old BTC versus BCH thing, but I was just, that just kind of struck me and amazed me a little bit. So one thing that is interesting. So yesterday I went to a crypto event, so I'm trying to do more of these uh, recently. At first I thought there is like, it's just Belgium. There is not much, too much to do, but 
apparently if you go if you really look for them there's a whole bunch to do a whole bunch of them so i went to brussels so like uh, full of europe and so it's i went by public transport and it nice. was a an event with public speakers but uh, it also had time before and afterwards for some networking so some people were very pleasantly surprised to find out there's a smart dev working on bitcoin cash so it was very fun to like it blew people's minds that this was a combination like in in, wow. in belgium that there was some guy working on uh, smart contracts yeah, so that was pretty fun but also there were four entrepreneurs on stage and they asked them like uh, where are you located where's your headquarters and like half of them, two of the four, were headquartered in Belgium and the other were uh, headquartered abroad. And they asked them, oh, what would you recommend? What do you think about the regulatory environment? And one guy was located in Belgium and he said, I would never do it again. So that only leaves one out of the four. And but then they also asked, what do you think is the best place to be located or where is it is the most future for crypto? And they, uh, I think... Three out of the four, but then the, the fourth one just wasn't too informed on the, the topic. They said Latin America. So I thought, and one said specifically Brazil, that he was uh, doing a lot of work in Brazil and it was a great environment there. So I, I'm not I'm not sure how close this ties into the global south, but uh, I, this is just an uh, anecdote that I heard like yesterday with Latin America being a great place for all things crypto innovation. So I thought that was uh, interesting. Well, that, yeah, that's a meme that I've been pushing for a while. Um, so, yeah, I'll have to agree with him on that. But in Brazil, I mean, that's a very large uh, market. I mean, that's, you know, hundreds of millions of people. And the government is very um, authoritarian when it comes to people uh, moving money. So, I mean, I think it's great if you're going to take a non formal approach you know if somebody wants to go to brazil and form a company and do you know follow the regulations and get approvals forget it just forget it you know i've seen other people try that it's just not workable oh. but if, you, but if you're mm -hmm. going to serve brazilians who for you know any number of dozens of reasons need to uh you know earn money or spend money in crypto or move money across borders with crypto, you know, uh, there, there are a lot of people in Brazil who are excited about crypto and they have a real need, you know? So, you know, definitely. Yeah, one of the interesting things they also mentioned to me, so what I found out is that the next big Ethereum event, I think it's called ETH, ETC, uh, is coming to Brussels next year. So in 2024, it will be a, a Brussels event, so they, they told me I had to attend, so I guess that I'm <laughs> going. I've never been to an Ethereum event, so, but I, if it's in Brussels, then yeah, I feel like I, I, should, uh, I should go. And I, I'm, I'm sure I would learn some, like it's good to keep an eye out on other ecosystems, and especially Ethereum, because they have been really innovating, whereas I think that BTC, they, they aren't doing, doing anything uh, interesting. So it's good to look at the ones innovating and see what we can learn, right? Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Like um, I, I've been, had an interest in kind of non-state dispute resolution for a while. So I've been following projects like um, JOR and uh, uh, Aragon are, are all in Ethereum. And, uh, and this idea of creating like uh, network states or, you know, non-state non governance organizations, you know, and um you know, what they're doing is very interesting, but they keep like running these campaigns where they say, hey, come try it out. You know, we'll pay all the fees for you. <laughs> and I just wonder, you know, how sustainable, you know, that's going to be for them. Like it just feels like they're just kind of biding their time, you know, and Aragon is an old it's kind of an OG project, you know, and they should have taken off in a big way by now. And it's. I just feel like on BCH now with cash tokens, like we can realize these visions. Yeah. There is a, so much possibilities. Um, uh, I'm not sure. We haven't seen any Ethereum uh, projects moving over, so it would de definitely be interesting, uh, interesting to hear what they think. We saw with the Slime Shadies, we saw one 
avalanche project uh, moving over. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so my thoughts on the Ethereum ecosystem, the main thing I very strongly dislike is all the layer twos, right? There's like 20 oh, different right. vi viable, quote unquote viable, so different that you should research if you want to launch your project, you want to launch on Arbitrum, you want ZK rollups or optimistic rollups, you want to use base, and then you read in the, the, like the crypto news that base had like an outage that was paused for a full day, and that it has <laughs> centralized admin keys. So yeah, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable with many of these uh, layer two EVMs, and even some of them had, uh, have had rising fees, so they are not even like a fully scalable low fee environment. So this makes me very co uh, confident. Now I bet uh, with BCH that it's very valuable to have a, a scalable smart contract chain. Right? You need a different mm -hmm. architecture for your product, so it's not just copy paste. You need to redesign your global state applications to use local state and to pass uh, like messages between contracts. But you can, like, you can make. I think you can make any contracts work. Uh, like any, you might have to redo the re design. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. And so one person yesterday asked me, "Is it is it Turing complete then BCH?" And I told him, "Yeah, we we don't have loops." So. Uh, that's that's the thing that would be cool. Like uh, Jason Dresner has a proposal for bounded loops. So if you want to be oh, very nice. complete, you need yeah some way to do loops. But and then, then I'm not I'm still not sure because being Turing complete is like a very specific technical thing. So we might not be technically Turing complete if we add loops. But I think practically, like uh, which is of course more more important than academically. I think practically you could write any application that you want. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, you know, another interesting thing about cash tokens is I think it's I, I've read um, that it's going to make it easier to handle side chains in a way that's going to avoid some of the mistakes with smart PCH. And so, like, maybe some things we can do on side chains that are written in, you know, for example, Rust, that it's going to be super fast. Um and in that sense, you know, that, that I think that's going to be an interest, interesting way to scale as well, in addition to just using L1. Yeah, for sure. So uh, sidechains is a very interesting co concept. So I think, for example, an EVM sidechain, it's not too difficult to see why that would be useful uh, currently. But then in, if you think about the uh, long term, if you have a smart contract layer one, like why would applications want to do a sidechain? And then one one answer, for example, that Jason Dresner gave is if you want to have a specific prediction market application. And this mm -hmm. prediction market application, it needs uh, to keep track of uh, how it works is you have some some kind of Oracle corporation which keeps track with a complex math and matrices about how far each person deviated in his uh, Oracle messages from the rest of the group. So you can see if uh, one person is trying to cheat the system by providing incorrect uh, information about the real world events. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the topic that Paul Sports has been working hard on. So his, I think his main driver for the sidechain tech is because he wants to do prediction markets on BTC. So his prediction mm -hmm. market project is called Bitcoin Hivemind. Um, and this inspired Jason Dresner. And I know it has a, had a big impact on Roger Ver. And this also had a big impact on myself. So I'm a, now a real believer in the prediction market concept. Me too. And there's a, Me too. Yeah, there's a few projects on Ethereum that have, uh, have tried it some, to various like, uh, extents and with various success. Um, so, but I think prediction markets would be a great use case for sidechains uh, because, because you need like custom consensus rules. You, you don't want to do everything in your... Um, like in smart contexts, it would simply not be like feasible or practical to do all these complex matrices math inside. So it's easier to, just to do a bridge. And with cash tokens, you can do different kinds of bridge design. So I think on BCH, it's very much an unexplored space. Like what does the best bridge design look like? And we could copy, we could like emulate drive chain with our smart contracts, but drive chain has this limitation where it's just proof of work, minor vote, voting. And it's mm -hmm. quite optimistic in the assumptions it makes about uh, 
minor participation. So I think uh, it could have a low minor participation. And then especially because we're still a minority chain, it will be uh, much more popular to use some kind of proof of stake in the, uh, for the sidechain uh, bridging. So mm -hmm. with cash tokens, it's, yeah, you can have the different uh, shareholders or different uh, stakeholders in the, the project on the sidechain. They can have some votes, vote tokens, and they can take part in a governance process uh, to bridge, to vote on sidechain withdrawals. And I think, yeah, there's just a, a ton of possibilities. And Jason Dresner has then, of course, also written on this because he's, uh, he's planning, that's like his master plan, to eventually have a sidechain prediction market on BCH. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Uh, I interviewed him a couple of years ago um, about that topic. And, uh, you know, really interesting conversation and really exciting the idea that you could see you know, somebody on their mobile wallet in uh, Lagos, in uh, or wherever, and they're placing bets, you know, uh, essentially, and they're helping arrive at a consensus. And these things could, you know, make people, uh, you know, those who really, you know, make the right predictions, etc., could really be, you know, it could be a great wealth creator for them. It could also make markets so much more efficient, and you know you don't you won't have to be an accredited investor, you know, to participate, or you won't have to, uh, you know, pay you know insane uh, fees to participate. It's going to be open to literally everyone everywhere, and it could create a kind of hive mind, you know, for humanity. Yeah, so I like I like the. The term Bitcoin hive minds a lot where Bitcoin or yeah, any crypto aggregates this information in some kind of hive mind. But then the other uh, name that Paul Sports had for it is uh, Truthcoin. So that's why you will see his nickname is uh, Truthcoin on Twitter uh, mm -hmm. because this is his main, yeah. And I think uh, prediction markets really like, uh, because it's called Truthcoin, it really is a way to get to the, to the truth. So, uh, Whereas with m lots of media things, there's often like a misdirection and a kind of manipulation going on. But with, uh, with these prediction markets, it's, uh, if you are the underdog and if you say left while, while everybody else thinks right, and then at the end you, you were correct, then you will have made an you know, like insane amount of money just by, uh, by placing your money where your mouth is. So I think this is inc incredibly powerful concept. And I think, yeah, I think it's very important that, for this that you think a lot about having decentralized oracles, right? So mm -hmm. centralized oracles uh, have, yeah, very obvious limitations. But even the way, yeah, chain link and stuff, I think uh, oracles remain like an Achilles heel in crypto. And the way Paul Sports worked it out, so I, I've read the, uh, the white paper for the Bitcoin hive mind and now, uh, few times and sometimes I don't make it all the way through because it's quite complex, but it's really, it's really well thought out, right? The way he writes about how uh, voters, like uh, how people providing, so they have, a, they have this role in the Oracle Corporation where they need to provide accurate information about real world events um, mm -hmm. and they need to do so concealed. So you, they don't need to reveal what they think and until a certain time. So they hash it and they commit to it in advance, but then only afterwards, everybody uh, reveals. So you really have an incentive to tell the truth because you don't know what other people are telling, right? So it's hard to coordinate on a specific lie because, because of this. And there's a bunch of other clever things and a, a bunch of clever mechanisms to make sure that it's in everybody's best interest uh, not to try to form a cartel. So it's, uh, it relies just like drive chain does. It relies on, on game theory and economic thinking. Uh, and then some clever mathematics to make sure that uh, people who deviate from the consensus and then who turn out to be uh, like liars providing wrong information for their own benefit, they get punished. So it's a bit like in proof of stake where they get slashed, so their tokens or their stake gets uh, taken away from them. And uh, it's redistributed to the, honest, uh, to the honest actors. So not only do the honest actors not get punished, they actually benefit if... Uh, somebody tries to gain the system.
So, uh, yeah. Yeah, with the, if, if, uh, with the recommended paper, it's not an easy read, but you can always just uh, skim over the technical parts and try to understand as much as possible. But I thought it was a, like an awesome paper. And I'm like, uh, I think prediction markets should be talked more of in the whole crypto scene because it's still a niche ID, but it's certainly one with the potential to change the whole world. I could not agree more. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, we can wrap up now. This has been a really great conversation. Uh, I do want to leave a space here in case uh, one of our current speakers wants to jump in and uh, say anything. Okay, well, yeah, hey, Matthew, I really want to thank you uh, for doing this uh, space with me. In fact, uh, you kind of prompted me to do it. Um, <laughs> so thanks. And uh, this has been a really good conversation. And I think, um, you know, I don't want to speak for you, but I think I'll probably keep doing it um, every Friday. Yeah, I would love to join next week too. So uh, awesome. I'll, I'll try great. to make time. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's enormous opportunity here with cash tokens. And uh, not only that, but you have people standing by to help you uh, get up to speed on this. So uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, join on Telegram, the cash token underscore devs group. Um, you know, and anytime anybody should feel free to DM me on Twitter, Telegram, wherever. Uh, and I will help orient you as I'm, you know, I'm sure Matthew uh, would as well. Um, so thanks everybody. Thanks, uh, John. Thanks, Matthew. Um, and, and, you know, let's keep building Bitcoin cash. Yeah. Thanks everybody for listening and thank you for hosting George. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks for co-hosting. Okay. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.